I've, we've not done a training session the way we're doing this one before. Uh, I've built, um, I, I guess for the landscapers in the room, I can't really call this a landscape, but we've got a tub of soil and we're gonna try and build an irrigation system in this as we're going, uh, which you may not be able to see from where you're sitting, but it might be something that you can come over to and look at maybe something that you haven't seen before and understand the way we've done it. The reason I wanted to do this was just to give some um, context around heights of valve boxes and heights of sprinklers and um, I guess proximity of drippers and drip tube to plants and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll get right into it. So before you start, um, before you do anything, before you buy any irrigation materials, before you dig any soil up, uh, you, it's really important that you collect um, all the right information for your irrigation system. So the two key things, well, there's probably more than two key things, but the key things that we require as an irrigation shop to help you put your irrigation system in at the very best that you can is the water flow in litres per minute, the water pressure in whatever pressure measurement you want to use, a scaled diagram of the area you want to water and then what you want to do within that. So controller locations, water locations, what type of plants you're watering, soil types, slopes, that kind of thing. Um, the absolute rawest version of that would be we could probably deal with litres per minute and a scaled diagram and we can work around that. Um, you know, we'll assume soil types, we can assume um, there's no slope if you haven't mentioned it. So the way that you would get your flow traditionally would be to use a bucket with a predetermined litres in it, so a five litre bucket or a nine litre bucket. Turn your tap open to full, stick the bucket underneath and time how long that bucket takes to fill up. You can supply us or your chosen irrigation store with the liters and the time, and then they can reverse engineer that and get down to liters per minute, which will then enable us to design an irrigation system because all of the sprinklers and drip tube that you'll buy from a professional irrigation store has data behind it that enables us to give you the exact requirements. Alternatively, you can use a flow device. This is something that we bought on, I, think we, I don't even know if we can get these, but I think we bought it on eBay because they had none in stock, but um, this is a Gardena flow meter. So you can put that onto a tap and turn your tap on and then it will actually measure the, the flow on the device. Um, you can use it in conjunction with the pressure gauge and then you can adjust your pressure to suit. So um, if we're doing um, a kind of a, a commercial irrigation system, we'll, it's really important that we know the pressure and the flow and it's important that we know the static pressure which is the pressure when it's off. So you could put the, this onto a tap there so there's water coming in there and turn the ball valve off and then the pressure that's on that would be the static pressure. Is there anything you want to add around pressure and flow? Uh, no, that's fine. Uh, static pressure's static pressure's a good one for us to get. So if at least if you can give us a, a flow rate, which is the liters per the liters it takes to fill up the bucket, but if you can get a pressure on the tap with no water flow, so just basically turning a tap on and giving us a pressure, at least gives us an indicator of what that the the pressure in that SA water network is because obviously um, something around St. Peter's area, um, your eastern suburbs is going to be a little bit higher than what it is going to be at Glenelg. Um, so it's good to always know and then one side of the road can be completely different um, depending on which side that network's come off of. So a static pressure is probably, I guess, just as important but not always available because you guys have obviously got buckets on site, but you're not necessarily going to walk It's often a luxury for us more than a necessity. Yeah. Um, I guess it's... The we'll quality of information quality, yeah. we get, the better the result's going to be for you guys as well. So, uh, so obviously planning, like with anything that you're going to do, the the quality of the result that you're going to get for the install is going to be driven by obviously the, the, the I guess the quality of the work that you do, but the information that you provide, the, I guess that measure twice cut once situation, even when you're installing, it's going to save you um, product as well. Um, I'm also conscious not to go too deep into a lot of this because it has been um, described as an irrigation basics training session, but if there's any high detail or, or questions that you might have come across, there's obviously going to be varying skill sets inside this group. If there's questions you want to ask, yell out and we'll answer them inside that. Um, I'm sure that there's probably another three or four people thinking the same question and they just don't want to put their hand up. So planning is really important. Same, I guess we do a lot of garden lighting as well, um, and it's really important to get your... Um, I guess conduits and cables and all of the uh, relevant products underneath driveways, paths, um, foundations in some cases if it's stormwater or, um, or sewer. So I guess that's probably it from a planning point of view. Uh, we have these planners here, which you, I mean, it does, this, I mean, I talk, I say we, 
any professional irrigation shop's going to have the same kind of thing. Obviously, I prefer that you buy stuff from us, but it's not necessary if you <coughs> don't like Matt or something. But that's a one to a hundred scale plan. So you, you would draw a, I guess, um, one to one meter is best for us, but we can work with whatever scale. Uh, we have a, an in-house, take a seat. Do you want a drink? You can say yes, it's all right. <laughs> it's all good. Um, we've got an in-house designer that does CAD designs. So we do a lot of really large commercial designs, but we also do residential designs. So we can do designs from that, you know, hand-drawn design all the way up to suppliers with a CAD file. And we can then submit that for approval for a developer or a, um, or a council or whoever's going to be the one that's signing off on it. All right, so once you've got the design, you've got the layout that you want to do, um, one of the questions that we'll ask is, do you want to do an automatic system or a manual system? Uh, I guess for a budget conscious job, the, the answer is going to generally be manual, which means that they're going to run off of a garden tap and just turn the tap on when they want the water to go out to the garden, or they're going to use a tap, not a tap timer really, it's manual, isn't it? So um, it's really ball valve on, ball valve off. So that's a ball valve for anyone. That's so, Or it'll just be a nut and tail onto a tap. Um, then the other side of that is to have an automatic system. An automatic system can comprise of an irrigation controller, which is wall mounted and 24 volts. So you'll plug it in, sorry, 240 volt down to 24 volt. So you'll plug that into your, to your wall and then you'll run irrigation cable out to your valves. The only other side, I guess the other side of the automatic controller is the battery operated controller. So um, we'll drill down into this a bit later on, I think. But uh, it's a battery operated controller that sends an electronic pulse through to a coil that then turns the same valve on. So you'd have to change the top of that for the top of that. So automatic irrigation obviously costs more to set up at the start. If you're doing a bank of four or six solenoid valves or ball valves, the cost is so close. Really, the only additional thing you're really buying is the controller and the cable. Um, a ball valve might only be, you know, it might cost 60 to 70% of a whole solenoid valve. You still have to manifold, so that's a manifold. You still need to manifold a manual system. So if you're looking at putting a manual irrigation system across a large area, I would in, I'd suggest that you get a price to do both and then I guess look at the economics of whether or not it's something that either you or your client can afford to do. Uh, automatic gives you so much more flexibility, especially <coughs> with Wi-Fi. That's a Wi-Fi dongle for that controller. Um, the, if you can start being smart about the way that you're delivering the water to the job, then the savings will be made in water and then hopefully it will offset whatever the additional cost was to go from manual to automatic. There's not really any disadvantages or advantage to either of them other than that. No, I guess it goes back to the start where we're talking about planning. Um, if you, I guess a lot of landscapes now, there's quite a significant amount of hardscaping and tiling and paving. Um, we, we, irrigation at some point, and it's normally later in the project, becomes part of this project. Um, where at the start, planning for allowing for conduits to have your irrigation cables under pathways or um, driveways and that sort of stuff is needs to be thought out. You don't necessarily need to buy the cable straight away, but at least get that conduit down. And that's when a lot of the time we see, I guess, the battery controller becoming the only option because you've got a brand new exposed aggregate driveway that's gone in and then they can't get irrigation cable through. So then, and they're not going to obviously cut a brand new driveway so now we go to battery um, which battery is still fine from an automatic point of view but you've got 12 month changeovers on on um, on the units itself and I'm sorry on the battery and you just need to make sure then you've got your customer actually going out to the valve box and accessing that valve box whereas they don't necessarily have to touch that they can just deal with a controller on the wall so just making sure if you are planning on an automatic system be prepared at the start to make sure you've got conduits down. Um, you know, a, an electrician's put a PowerPoint on the wall outside for you or in the laundry or something like that, and yeah, you'd be good to go. Cool. Yep. So if you do go down the, um, the automatic pathway, the way, and I'm, I, I guess this is basics of irrigation, so I'm gonna probably go through stuff that a lot of you already know, but I'll go through it quickly, and if anyone's kind of unsure, ask me. So the way an irrigation, it's just a clock, um, a fancy computerized clock that turns on a 24 volt alternating, alternating current to deliver electricity through multi-core cable to a solenoid valve. The electricity goes through a common, which we uh, always would use black for, and then one of the other colors. So when you wire up a controller, there'll be 
Um, so if that's a four station controller, you'll have C, one, two, three, four. And then you'll have valve one, valve two, valve three, valve four. The common wire is gonna to go to every valve. And then the, I guess the valve wire becomes the wire that um, closes a circuit. So mo I'm assuming most of you understand basic electronics. That'll become a circuit. Um, that'll become a circuit. So the common always has electricity going down one and then one, two, three or four has electricity going down the other. I just did the common twice. So the valve, these valves, these are 24 volt alternating current valves. As long as there's electricity running through the path of these wires, so like common and one and that turns on, uh, the valve will stay open. So if the cable was to get cut on site by someone working or the power was to go off on site because the electricity went down or the safety switch dropped off, that valve will close. So um, it's not really a fail safe or anything, it's just the way they operate. Um, these valves specifically are, a norm, uh, I guess, a fail closed solenoid valve, uh, which means that they have a reverse flow, which we'll go into a bit later, it's probably a bit more high level. Um, so they'll generally fail closed. The, this is a 0.5 mil squared cable that I'm holding in my hand. The cable that like, like you guys would probably be using on larger sites would be a one mil or a 1.5 mil. You can run half mil cable out to about 120 meters max, yep. and then you're gonna start getting voltage drop, which is possibly gonna affect the coil opening and closing. Uh, so the next size up from half mil is one mil, then it goes to 1.5 mil. Commercially, we use 1.5 mil for most jobs until we get to Dakota, which I'm not gonna go through today, but um, Dakota's a two wire path, so you're only using two cables. Obviously, a commercial site, you might have 30 or 40 valves, then you'd need to run 31 or 41 cables, which starts to get really costly, and troubleshooting becomes an issue. Uh, when we run one and a half mil cable for a commercial system, we'll usually use two mil or two and a half mil, or, four, half mil. or four mil commons, yep. um, and then we're starting to get into a situation where we can get kilometers out of our runs rather than hundreds of meters. <coughs> When you install cable and wire it to a solenoid valve, like with any electrical connection, it's really important that it's done right. Uh, if you do it right, it's gonna work for you. If you don't do it right, you're gonna have trouble with it later. The connections also need to be waterproof because obviously it's going into a box in the ground, which is likely to have water in it or at least moisture from time to time. So everyone gets that. So however many valves you choose to have, you need that number of valves plus one. Uh, if you have, I guess, uh, four solenoid valves, most of the time we're going to encourage people to put seven core cable in there because it enables them to have two spare cables because you never know what's going to happen. Someone, If it's a client's job, then they're always going to add something or um, even if it's your own house, if you want to add, um, get more specific around your irrigation, then you've got the cable there to do it. If you don't, there's tools available to split a line. So this might be a, an issue that's come up for guys that are going and working on existing systems. You can get, what are they, the... Attestation. Attestation, and there's a four, uh, add a four. Out of four, yeah, and splitters and yeah. So this, it, it's a small product <clears throat> that goes at that down this end. Yeah. And it learns the controller's runtime and then halves it for a two station. Yep. So if you've got these four and there's four cables, but you want to add a fifth valve, you change runtime of number four to double what you want it to be. And then it splits it out between four and five. It's ideal not to use those if you can avoid it, but they're there. They're products um, that's home. They're home and do a lot of troubleshooting products, don't they? <laughs> <clears throat> they're quite good so once we get your irrigation design um, we will either hand draw the design and um, in most cases we'll supply a client with a, an, an estimation of the materials that they require and the cost and then they'll pick and choose what they want to buy or not and it'll be a most of the time at the moment we're getting sprinkler for the lawn and then drip tube for the garden beds so drip tube comes in uh, obviously rolls which you can see we've got all here um, the drip tube that we've got there is Netafim, which is a product that's made in Melbourne. And then the drip tube here is made by Toro, which is a product that's manufactured here in Beverly, at, um, or Toro at Beverly. Uh, I've got purple drip tube in my hand. Purple products are uh, used in areas where there's recycled water and it's to signify that the water is not safe for drinking and it's designed to stop people from maybe putting their mouth around a dripper or opening a valve box to try and get water from a solenoid valve or whatever they might do. My personal opinion is that it should all be purple, but um, I don't think the aesthetics works for a lot of residential landscaping. If you use a drip tube on a roll, 
uh, it's generally going to be a 0.3 spacing or a 0.4 spacing, which is related to the the dripper spacing between, I guess the spacing between drippers. So it's going to be either 0.3 of a meter or 0.4 of a meter, obviously not on the same tube. And then when we do a large grid of irrigation, we then run those tubes parallel to each other at the distance that the dripper is in general. So it's going to be 0.3 by 0.3 or 0.4 by 0.4. And that creates a grid of water. And that ensures that no matter where you plant your plant inside that grid, the plant's going to get the right amount of water because as these drippers are operating, they'll create a bulb of water. So generally, if that's the ground and you've got dripper, a drip tube on top, the dripper will be like that. And then it creates kind of a bulb of water underneath. And then the next dripper should, if designed properly, start to join up those bulbs of water. So that's why the soil type comes in to play when we're designing an irrigation system. If it's quite sandy, we need to adjust the spacing of those drippers to ensure that those bulbs, and correct me if I'm wrong, don't kind of bulb out like that. Um, where, and clay soil is obviously going to spread out on at the top, uh, I guess, quite quickly. This will also help us give you suggestions around the run time so that you might want to pulse water an area so that you're not losing the water or that you're not having runoff on a clay area and you kind of water for say 15 minutes and then wait an hour and then water for another 15 minutes. If you don't use drip tube, you can use individual drippers. In front of you, you've got all these sample bags. So Antelco is a company that we have a very good relationship with. They've been generous enough to donate some samples in here. These, these are all for you to take home as well. Um, so there's an extra large t-shirt in everyone's bag. So hopefully that works for maybe none of you. <laughs> but yeah, all of the products, well, most of the products that Antelco make are made here in South Australia. They've got a manufacturing facility at Murray Bridge. Um, obviously we can choose to buy from whoever we want, but Murray, um, it's, not, it's not just a convenient thing to, for us to buy from Antelco. They also make really good products. Um, the development team are always working on new things. The reason I wanted to bring it up now is that's a dripper. That's a dripper. So um, you might have seen it on one of our famous films that we make, but um, that's a two liter per hour, two liter per hour pinch drip, which is a pressure compensating dripper that spikes into the ground. And then you can run four mil poly off of that to a lateral pipe, which will be a piece of poly pipe, plain poly pipe. So you'll run a piece of pipe between there and there. We'll do that over there in a sec. These would be used in situations where the planting may be not quite as dense and you want to just have a dripper on on whatever on plants or you might have a need to increase the amount of water this one's an eight liter an hour the green so you might want to put more water in one spot this drip tube here is a, probably a 1.6 liter per hour per dripper the toro is generally two liters per hour per dripper and then off the shelf you'll be able to buy a two four or eight liter per hour dripper in either a spike like this or they've got a pinch drip as well a lot of this stuff this information is available on youtube as well so i'm not going to go too far into it but um, the pinch drip and these are the same, they're, they're the same operation, they're just delivered differently. So that's a spike and that just sits on the ground. We've got some customers that choose to only use these because it enables them to get watering exactly to where they want it. Once it's spiked in the ground, it's unlikely that it's going to move away. Obviously, you can use pegs to hold your drip tube down. They can be that or metal. Uh, this just gives more direct watering and some of them believe that when you do a grid watering system like this, uh, you're also watering, I guess, weeds and areas that might not require water. Um, so that's, look, and that's completely up to you. Uh, as an irrigation shop, I see it as our responsibility to, I guess, arm you guys with the most quality information, and then it's up to you to choose what you want to do. Um, and that doesn't stop at the end of this training session. We're always here to help with answering questions and, I guess, um, highlighting new products. We do a lot of that through our media, where DK, he films a lot of the stuff that we do. When there's new products coming in, we'll do a a breakdown of that product and why it's good and why we think it's good. So that's drippers. Um, we'll, we'll put us some, we might actually I might get you to start cutting some like header pipes and stuff now. For, for a drip tube. For a so, drip tube. Um, yeah, so basically what I've got is like an inch header at one side and then a 19 at the other side with a reducing T's mm -hmm. for takeoffs. So you could do like, so there you two and then run a black poly from one and then a drip tube from the other. So then we can do punches off the black. Do you know what I mean? Yep. Yep. <laughs> so uh, just to, this is not obviously a standard way of installing an irrigation system, but I just want to get a lot of the, the things that we've spoken about actually in here so that you can see them being used. So Matt's going to run a 25 mil header pipe and then a 19 mil collector here. The 
25 mil header pipes, the best size, even if you just do like there to there. Just just yeah, that that way. there. Yeah. 25 mil header pipe, the reason that we use that is to keep the flow of the irrigation system up to enable us to get the most amount of drippers on the station. It also works better with the takeoff elbows. So I, I don't know if you've got them in your bag, but they're not in there, which is great. Uh, when you do a when you do a drip irrigation system, that one that I've just drawn there, I'll use that as an example. You'll have a, a, a delivery manifold at one side in, in most installations and a collection manifold on the other side and they'll have end pieces and air release valves and flushing valves which we'll deal with in a sec. When you connect that pipe to the, the pipe, you can either do it using a, a traditional T, so a reducing T, which Matt's got in his hand now, or you can use a takeoff elbow. Thanks, man. So these are the takeoff elbows here. They uh, get punched into the top of the pipe. So you'll punch a hole into the top of that and click it in and then you'll run the drip. Have any of you used these? Are these familiar? Yep, 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 maybe. No. When you push them into there? Yeah. yeah. So, like kind of five in a hundred or ten in a hundred kind of thing? So that's that's probably the only weakness of these. They're they're very good from a speed point of view. You can, yeah, so that's like Matt's just installed there. So he's got the yeah, same deal. When I used to install, I used to use these and then I'd find that I'd have to then go cut them out. Like not all of them, but you'd find some would be leaking and then you'd go cut them out and put reducing tees in. And then I guess it does create an inconsistency. Yeah. If you're trying to deliver a really quality finish, which like I, no one's here trying to do shit landscaping. So this is probably the best plan of attack for you guys if you want to ensure that it's not going to be an issue. Uh, we do a lot of designs for commercial work. So Adelaide City Council refuse to allow their contractors to, to use these at all. It, you would have experienced that. They have to be uh, a reducing tee. And Cobra clamps, which we'll talk about soon, which are a stainless steel metal clamp. Well, stainless steel is metal, but a metal clamp that clamps down around the poly fittings and then you're not going to have any problems. If you do use these, and a lot of people do, the most important thing to remember is that inch pipe is going to operate better than 19 mil pipe because it's got a a larger area of curve. Is that even a thing? So the 19 mil's obviously got a, a tighter curve. So when you punch this into the 19 mil, the chances of you making that hole more egg-shaped than circular is higher than using what Matt's got in his hand. Have you, oh, here you go. So this is a punch tool that you'd use. If you aren't familiar, that punches a hole in the pipe and then that clicks into the pipe and then you push the poly pipe onto there. These used at, with pressure reduction shouldn't leak and in Netafim, so you, uh, not Netafim, Antelco, so you don't need clips on these as well, don't they? After pressure reduction. Yeah. So if there's but a I pressure always... reducer on the system, you can get away with not using clips. We'd still encourage you to use them, especially if you're driving another 40 minutes back to, to a client's house to replace a fitting that's blown off. So that, That's like 20 cents for a yeah. clip. Even so. if you're not going to use Cobra clamps, even just using an Antelco plastic clamp. So... Um, I'll talk about clamps quickly while we're, we're on it. <clears throat> so in your bags, you've got a 15 mil, well, it's not a 15 mil, it's a 13 mil, but it's got a 15 written on it. That's an Antelco clamp. We only stock Antelco plastic clamps. Um, I've been stocking Antelco clamps here and then in my previous employment for probably 15 years. <clears throat> they just work. We find that they are reusable. They're not brittle. Um, if you're not going to use a metal clamp, I encourage you to use an Antelco clamp. You can. I think Filmat clips are pretty good as well, aren't they? Yeah, they're okay. They make pretty yep. good clips. I think you pay for them though. But um, I made a video about this recently. It, we get, um, I guess, if you buy a clamp from a hardware shop, the likelihood is that it's probably a Pope clip or a Taiwanese clip or a Chinese import clip. They'll cost exactly the same as the clips that you buy here or any of your chosen irrigation shops, but these just work. So uh, if you want to go to the next level, there's two brands that we stock and you'll probably find there's no other brands in irrigation shops. So we've got the, the silver stainless steel clamp that they have for, they're a Cobra clamp, they're the original. And then Toro went and copied them and made these colourful hippo clamps. We went to market with the hippo clamps at a lower rate and Toro did a big uh, promotion on them. And we found that a lot of clients have actually gone back to the Cobra clamp, which is the original. Um, would that be fair? Like most people are going back to these or are you still selling a lot of the other ones? Yeah, the Cobras um, can be clamped up using a multi-grip as well. They do have a specialty tool, but they can be done with a multi-grip. So if you are in a pinch and you don't have the selective tool, you're not sort of stuck a, and you can't actually use it. So in a pinch, yeah. Um, um, 
whereas the hippo clamp requires the actual tool. It can't be done out done up without it. So. Yeah. So we can run some other stuff off it. Yeah. So <clears throat> I'll, I'll, once we finish the training session, anyone that wants to come and have a shot at putting a cobra clamp on and taking it off and putting a clip on and taking a clamp off comes and do that. I'm sure there's people here that have done 4,000 of these today and probably aren't interested in me doing a everyone have a shot with the clamp day. But um, I won't go home until everyone's satisfied that they've had their training. So um, if you want to talk about more stuff, we will do that and we'll let everyone have a shot with the clamps. So that's the drip tube side of things. Um, for drip tube to operate at its best, it needs to operate under the correct pressure, which is what these are pressure reducers here. So Netafem would recommend that you use your tech line at what, 180 to 300? Yeah, 250 highest. So, sort of thing, yeah. so the numbers I'm talking are KPA. So between what, 180 and 250 KPA, it ensures that a pressure compensating dripper, which is what I probably haven't touched on, the drip tube that we're using is pressure compensating, which means it's got a rubber diaphragm inside the dripper that regulates the water to ensure that the water that's being delivered matches the number that the charts say that it's going to do, which is the charts that we use to design the system against the pressures and the flows that you've provided us. It also requires filtration to a degree. Um, tap water is pretty clean, but we still put it. These, these are really good. These are a Rainbird product. They're a pressure reducer filter all in one. Um, the good thing with them is they're compact. compact. Obviously, block sizes are getting smaller. Um, and, you know, a big, dirty green valve box in the middle of a really nice landscape doesn't really look ideal. So the less that we can have those valve boxes, the better. Bear with me. <laughs> Just talk amongst yourselves. So, yeah, um, that's a pressure reducer filter. There's a 20 mil one and a 25 mil one. The the filter on this is a stainless steel screen that's inside there. So it's only really a precautionary filter. It's quite a small screen, so you're not going to be able to, you know, run water from a dam and not have to clean this out every hour. But the good thing with this is you need a pressure reducer to run most of these things anyway. If you're going to put one in, we'd suggest you put a Rainbird one in because it's got the filter and you got, what are these, 35 bucks or something? Mm -hmm. You're going to pay 25 for a probably pressure reducer anyway. Even though you're usually, usually using mains water, if something goes wrong on the street and then there's a, a repair being done, there's chances sometimes that you're going to get rocks and debris through your house, which is going to affect more than your irrigation system, but we're only really worried about your irrigation system. This filter will ensure that no rocks or debris get through to your drip tube, which is obviously, obviously going to affect the ability for your drip tube to work, as well as your sprinklers. The sprinklers will have a filter in the base of them, which will help with that. Not all of them, some of them. Sorry, there's a filter between the spray head and the spray and the body, which will stop them from getting damaged. But you're still going to get a phone call from your client saying, hey, the sprinklers aren't working. I mean, you're going to get a phone call saying these are blocked, but at least that's only one thing. It's not six or eight sprinklers. Uh, on that, while I'm talking about it, these will need maintenance. So you can't just stick a, a filter in your system and never touch it again. It's like a car. You, you need to service the, the system. Um, and I'm not sure how many of you guys have that as part of a service of, in your business or if, you, if you've even thought about it, but um, I guess a, a winterization and a dewinterization of any irrigation system is not a bad idea. If you can add it as a service for your clients and send them out an email, I mean, that's your business, what you want to do, but it would add value and it will ensure that the system lasts the 15 or 25 years that these things can last. So um, that's probably it from drip tube, spacing, pressure reduction, air release valves and flushing valves. So we, the last two things we'd put on a drip system would be air release valves and flushing valves. The air release valve is designed to let air in and out of the system when you turn it off. Netafem do an anti-siphon drip tube, which once, it, once it's full, it doesn't allow water to leave the dripper unless there's 100 kPa coming in. Mm -hmm. Is that right? So the air release valve becomes less important because the system's full of water all the time and there's no way air can get back in. With the traditional dripper or the Toro drip tube, which is a, a standard drip tube, it's not an anti-siphon. When it turns off, the tube completely empties out of water. And when it turns back on, it pushes air out of those drippers. When it's doing that activity, if it's under mulch or in dirt, there is a chance that it will suck dirt into the dripper and then obviously damage the drip tube. The air release valve ensures that the air can get out the air release valve. An air release valve needs to be installed at the highest point, And we still put them on all systems, don't we? It's just yes. the flushing valves are more of a a manual than an automatic. Correct. So the air release valve works automatically and if it's installed properly, you won't have any problems with it. Flushing valves are a product that Netafem have sold forever or 20 years. And they 
will flush the system with a predetermined amount of water at the start of each cycle. The problem is they fail quite regularly and you'll find you've got a spotter box. I don't know if you guys have experienced this that's full of water and it's just dumping water because its flushing mechanism has worked and there's a rock stuck there and it, and it can't close. So what we recommend is a an inline valve. That's branded. We've got a VQA out here. So basically just a little plastic tap at the end of the system that you can open up every three or five or six or eight months or whatever you feel fit and you can blow water out of the system. It's unlikely you're going to have anything in your system anyway, but it's there as a, as a flush. Alternatively, fold over the end of your pipe, 25 mil PVC will fit over that, 19 mil will fit over that and just pull the pipe off and blow the pipe out there. It'll save you buying a fitting. I mean, if you're going to the extent of putting in an irrigation system, I'd encourage you to tick all those boxes and ensure that you've put in the safeguards to make sure that it works. Has anyone got any questions so far about that? That's a VQA. So that's another Antelco product. Inline tap, you just have that in a box somewhere, open it up, turn your system on, blow any debris that might be in there. This is also recommended to do at the start of the install. So once you've finished installing the whole system, blow the system out so that there's no dirt. Um, the top installers will tape each piece of pipe after they use it and go out to the next bit and then take the tape off and cut it and then tape it back up and you'll find that the the pipe is completely clean. It's unrealistic commercially for people to do that, I think, in some cases. So the best case is just to flush it out when, you, when you've got it to that point. So that's drip tube. Uh, I'll talk about sprinklers, then we'll talk about automation and valves. So uh, when we get the scale diagram off of you guys, we will... Why does this always happen? the blackboard so we'll get an, uh, a scale diagram from someone with the area of lawn that they want to water I probably should have designed that shape shouldn't I good. Um, no, I'll design it for an irrigation store the most ideal shape for us to water is a perfect square or the second is a two squared rectangle so if they were four meters by eight meters or three meters by six meters or a square in any dimensions a rectangle, we're going to put six sprinklers in like that with the intention of the sprinklers getting head-to-head -head coverage. So say that's five metres and that's 10 metres. That sprinkler throws five metres out to there, five metres down to there. That sprinkler throws five down to there, five up to there. That one throws and hits that one, that one, and that one. Can everyone see that? You guys understand that? Most of the sprinklers that we design with require so we've got the data around the sprinklers so we know what they throw but they need head-to-head -head coverage to ensure that they get uh the match precipitation which is the the i guess rainfall equivalent per square meter so it's like the is that the best way of describing it so each square meter gets the same amount of water which is probably the best way of saying it the only difference is the mps there's a new the side strips changed hasn't it yeah side strip you can do triangular i'll or just draw a, draw a verge so what we'll do is we'll design, a, so we'll get the scale diagram and we'll design what we need to design. And then we will calculate backwards how much water that system is using and then that'll tell you how many valves are required and then we'll plot the valves out. So, you know, we might have an irrigation. Most, most places these days that are kind of 600 or 300 square meter blocks in that kind of vicinity are, uh, what would you say, like four to six valves per site now. Yep. So... It's usually one lawn in the front, one garden in the front, one lawn in the back, one garden in the back. When you get a verge like this, which is what 1.8 say, because that's I think what fits <laughs> by nine. Yep. <laughs> that works. You can put a side strip in. And what one there? Yep. No, that's too far. 4.5. That's right, isn't it? Yeah. So you can water like that with a side strip. Um, is everyone familiar with the MP rotators? No, no, yep, yep, MP rotators, finger sprays, no. So since sprinklers were invented back in the impact sprinkler days, it became a gear drive, then it became an MP rotator. The MP rotator is a rotary nozzle that was the first to market. It used to be owned by a company called Walla Walla, which Nelson distributed and then Hunter bought the product, which they, they've done with the Hydrawise controller as well. It's probably one of the most revolutionary ideas in irrigation since irrigation really since mm. i guess pressure compensating drippers the they throw a finger spray and they're a genuinely matched precipitation sprinkler so 
provided the sprinklers are getting within 800 of head to head? Uh, normally about 500. 500. Yeah. So if you've got a, a spray and it's still short 500 of the other head, it's still going to get that 10 or 11 mil an hour yep. that they've, they're able to do. Um, they've changed, like, we, I think since water restrictions stopped in whatever, nine or 10, no, it was longer than that, wasn't it? 12? About 12, yeah. It was, everyone was using drip tube. <clears throat> now everyone's using MP rotators with drip tube in the gardens, if they're not using individual drippers in the gardens. Um, uh, Rainbird do an R van, which is, which never kind of took uh, the market quite as strong as the, the MP was. The MP covers so many different areas. So we can put an MP 1000 here, and then you can put MP left and left and right corner strip and a, and a center strip. So that might be hard to believe, but these sprinklers will throw 1.8 meters forward and 4.5 meters to the side. This one here will throw 4.5 meters each way and 1.8 forward, and then the other one will throw obviously the opposite of that one. Um, I, there's nothing comes close to them, is there really? No. I mean, you go from a system like that, which is three sprinklers and one valve, and barely one valve because it uses such is that a the small other thing amount they of use such, water. They use a quarter of so yeah. you've got the traditional pop-up sprinkler, which people would have seen in backyards from the 80s or 90s, with that just pop up and just throw a fan of water. Now they would use four times the amount of water per minute. They also mist, and it's harder to get that matched precipitation. Um, when we're when we're getting down to the real nitty gritty of you want to deliver twenty five millimeters of water per week onto a turf area to ensure that that turf gets the exact amount of water to ensure you've got a lush green surface without wasting water. It's really important that we understand how many mils that that works out to from a sprinkler point of view. So, an MP rotator uses ten or eleven mil an hour if designed properly, and they're under pressure reduction which means that we can then say, okay, to get 25 mil a week, we can do two hours and it would be what, two hour, two and a half hours, mm -hmm. roughly. We don't do roughly, but yeah, two and a half hours. And then that ensures you get 25 mil and then it also enables you or your client to go, okay, we've had four 40 degree days. The evaporation rate's really high. We need to do 35 or 40 mil of water this week so we can increase our watering times by an hour, which is easily done on your app, on your phone. And then your lawn's still getting what it was meant to get. Yeah? Yep. So... We'll design that. That's a sprinkler on a fitting. The sprinkler I'm holding in my hands is a three inch body. Uh, we stock Hunter and Rainbird bodies in two, three, four, six, and 12 inch. Not, yes. Yep. The three inch is probably the most common height because it's it pops up well. So that, that pop up height's high enough to clear most turf varieties. And it's not too deep that you guys are digging a trench that's gonna kill you, especially if you start doing hills face work and you're kind of trying to jackhammer these sprinklers into the ground. When you're doing a, um, a buffalo or a kaikuyu, if you have a look at the thickness, I mean, most of you have probably installed this, but you look at the thickness of that turf, the sprinkler needs to, I mean, that starts to thatch a bit and all of a sudden your sprinkler's not popping up enough to clear the turf. So uh, if you can get a four inch sprinkler in, do it. If you can't put a three inch in and then if you have troubles, you can obviously raise these up using fittings. Um, you can just screw the, the sprinkler off of the the elbow, and then you put a fitting onto the elbow and then put your sprinkler back on. So then you get another, what, 12 mil, 15 mil. mil. Yeah. So I'll get Matt to put a piece of pipe onto this fitting and clip it up and we'll bury it in the corner. I won't get him to put the full system in because I don't want him to get his hands too dirty. Um, these fittings don't require thread tape. So anytime you're screwing a fitting into a sprinkler, don't put thread tape on it. You just tighten it up so that it's tight. Like, you know, don't break it. You'll get a feel for it. If you put thread tape in there, uh, it puts the sprinkler at risk of damage. Sometimes the thread tape can get up, especially into a gear drive. For those that aren't familiar, a gear drive's a sprinkler that the water, um, the water turns the sprinkler around, so it's just spraying an arm of water and going back. If you get thread tape up in that gearing, that sprinkler's done. So the, the smaller areas, five and 10 meters, up to probably, with the MP rotators, 9.5 or 10.4 meter, edges you can do with an MP rotator. When you start getting into 14 and kind of if that was 14 by 28, then you'd need to start looking at using a gear drive sprinkler, which is the sprinkler that existed, which was the most common sprinkler prior to the uh, the MP rotator. They throw happily kind of nine to 12 meters. And then you're looking at then going into commercial sprinklers. So the kind of sprinklers that they'd use on a uh, sports field or a golf, not a golf course, a sports field, you're throwing kind of, what, 16 metres? 
yeah, 18 meters. 16 to 18 meters, yeah. And then on a golf course, we're starting to talk about, can you get me a golf sprinkler? This is just for pure interest sake, so you can see what they look like. They throw, what, 24, 26 meters that far across a fairway? Yeah, 22. 29, there yeah. you go. So once you see what this looks like compared to some of the other sprinklers, you'll understand what I mean. But we'll design the system around the sprinkler that's required. In most cases, any work you guys are doing, you're not going to go above a gear drive. Um, if you can stick an MP rotator, it's going to be easier for you guys to install. Um, and in my opinion, you'll get... Um, I mean, the, look, using a Rainbird 5000 or an 8000 is going to give you an unbelievable result. The, RV, the, the MP rotators just seem like a sprinkler that everyone has their head around. So that's a golf sprinkler. So that's got the, the valve in the head um, that pops up and then that'll throw 29 meters or thereabouts. So you used to work on a golf course? Oh, you did, didn't you? So that's, I guess, just to kind of recap. For, for an irrigation system, you need a water source and a way for it to operate and then something to get it out to the area. I haven't talked about subsurface for lawn. Um, you, can use, you can use drip tube for lawn as well. It's not as common to use it anymore. There was a big um, explosion of subsurface drip tube in kind of, I'm gonna, I wanna say 06 through to 09. Um, there was a product called KISS, which was a geotextile membrane wrapped drip tube. There was um, copper shield from Rainbird. Netafem still do a copper sulfate product. And then prior to all that, Netafem had a product called uh, TechLine with a tech filter. So they would then inject a chemical into the, the drip tube, which was a root intrusion inhibitor. The problem is that chemical has not ideal effects on humans um and it's been banned in europe and i think they're talk i mean that we still get them don't we tech filters yeah yeah they yeah. can't sell them in europe though can they no the, so eventually the they're probably be unavailable i mean anything that's getting banned in europe we probably not want to be we don't really want to be using um that trough is really the only true way of stopping root intrusion netafim have done a lot of tests around their x their xr yeah their copper shield product Yep. They've had great results. They're using it for growing almonds and they're not having any root intrusion issues. We've only been selling it for, what, five years? Not even? Three? Three years, five. yeah. Three to, so yeah. there's probably not enough yeah. test cases out there in the market to know that it's definitely going to work. Most of the manufacturers ma manufacturers will guarantee that it works, but no one's going and looking. So it's hard to say. But um, while sprinklers can be used and the MP rotator, which is not that sprinkler, can be used, um, it's probably not a bad thing just to use them. The MP rotator actually had, a, I think it's got, is it watermarked? It is, isn't it? Do you know? I'm pretty sure they're watermarked. Oh, they are. Yeah, they are. So when they were doing, um, I don't know if you guys remember, they were doing uh, rebates on uh, water saving devices such as shower heads and that kind of thing. And you could buy that, get your receipt. The MP rotator was qualified for that. So you could put an MP rotator in or drip tube. And because it was watermark approved, you could get a rebate back when they had, I guess, more stringent water restrictions. So what Matt's doing here is just getting the height right. So I'll just take that. So you can see there he screwed the fitting into the sprinkler. It's tight. He's put a, a Toro Hippo clamp on there, which is a stainless clamp, which is behind the barb. So you can't pull that off. That's as good as it needs to be. You can still twist that. That's not a problem. And then he's prepared an area to stick the sprinkler. Uh, that sprinkler can be adjusted. So the, the direction that the sprinkler's throwing can be adjusted, adjusted once the sprinkler's installed. So it's not critical that the nozzle's pointing in the right direction or that the angle's open the right amount. You want to be able to install these sprinklers so that you can drive a lawnmower straight over the top of them and the sprinkler doesn't even know you've been there. Now, a lot of people put pop-up sprinklers in and they're sitting above the turf, which defeats the whole pop-up part of the sprinkler. So don't be shy to have them low. Um, also, as you can see, that tube's curved up. If you've got really rocky areas and you're struggling to get the depth because you want to put a four inch sprinkler in, you can kind of come in with that pipe and taper it down, get to your sprinkler and then kind of go out the other side and then taper it back up. You just want to remember that if this pipe's shallow and you're coring or doing any other work, there's a likelihood that you're going to hit it and then you've got damaged pipe. So yeah, all good. Mm -hmm. So what he's put in there is a van spray, which is just a standard spray. We've got the R vans, which are Rainbirds equivalent to the MP rotator, which is a finger spray. It's hand adjustable um, and flushable. It uses more water per minute um, and they don't have the same diversity or then they've got a lot more nozzles out now, don't they? They've got all fixed arc and variable arc and HEs now as well. So 
you've got your drip tube in, you've got your sprinklers in, and you've got your valves in. Now it's just about connecting it all together and throwing in a controller of some sort. So I'll show you the, a manifold that we've, start, we've started building. So what you'll have when you start doing an automatic system is you have your, obviously your water source here or somewhere, and then you have a ball valve. So it's really important to install a ball valve at the start of your system. This is something that you need to get a plumber to do unless you guys have got a license to do it. Um, the ball valve is there to, you're going the wrong way. So embarrassing. <laughs> it's my office hands. So the ball valve is there to isolate the system if there's anything goes wrong. So you, if you put an automatic irrigation system in and then something blows after or this goes and you don't have a ball valve there, you need to isolate the water using your water meter and then your house is off until you get the situation sorted. If you can put a ball valve in, then your irrigation system maintenance can be done usually after Saturday at four o'clock when the plumbers are charging $500 an hour and you can wait till Monday to get it sorted out. Or, I mean, obviously you guys can probably deal with your own stuff. There's a non-return valve here, which is designed to stop water going back and con contaminating mains drinking water. This is required by SA Water, I guess. Yes, yeah, government. Yeah. There's different levels of backflow prevention. Residentially, this is probably the most you're gonna to have to deal with. If you start dealing with subsurface irrigation using a chemical, they require two RPZs, which are reduced pressure zone backflow prevention devices. They've gotta be put above ground. They're about $600 or $700 each installed, not including the maintenance every one. Have you put them in before? No. no. Back in. So most people would wanted to avoid that. I mean, I guess a lot of the, the more affluent areas were happy to just spend the 1500 bucks, stick the two RPZs in, put the tech line in because they wanted their lawn to still be growing in 2006 because they had their kid's fifth birthday and the bouncy castle was there and it had to look good. But now that it's, it's a much more, I guess it's a little bit lighter on. You can use an MP rotator. You're still being efficient, um, but you don't have all that other infrastructure costs. But you do need to have a non-return valve of some sort, even to the point of having a tap timer. You should have a single check. It's like a little brass one that screws on there that stops water going back. This is a manifold that I'm holding in my hand. This is a Spears manifold. So these are a mains pressure rated fitting that just thread together. Um, no thread tape required. They've got O-rings in them. They do a tablet version as well. Any one of you, you guys have probably all seen these before, I'm guessing. You don't have to use these for manifolds. You can use PVC fittings and glue them together. Uh, we'd sell more of these than PVC because they're easy to maintain. So you can actually barrel union a, a fitting out. So I can take that out. And that'll just that just removes, so you're not trying to turn a whole thing in the box. Uh, there's a lot of traditionalists that still prefer to make their valves out of uh, their manifolds out of PVC because they're glued and they're solid, and you know no ground movement's going to kind of twist a, a fitting and let some water out. Uh, everyone's got their own preferences. We stock them all. They're all mains pressure rated. They, are they mains pressure rated? Yes. Yep. Yeah, ten bar. So it's all good to go. Obviously, we've got a solenoid valve after that. There's an O-ring there, there's an O-ring there, so there's still no thread tape required. Once we get out here to the filter side of things, that's when we start needing to require thread tape because there's no O-ring there. So we'll thread tape both sides. Actually, to be honest, this side's got an O-ring in it, so it probably doesn't need thread tape, but it won't hurt to put it on. I'll just quickly show you thread tape. Uh, when you thread tape a fitting, uh, we use either pink or white thread tape. Pink thread tape's a bit thicker and um, I prefer to use it, so that's why I'm using this one. Um, you, you're going to hold the, the thread with your hand and then go clockwise around. The, if you see, I've got tension on this tape. Um, if I go the other way, I'll do this first, I'm able to keep that tight so I can keep the thread tape moving, keep it tight, pull it off. If I had it the other way, like that, as I'm twisting it, it's actually coming further and further off. So it's, I don't know if, if you guys all know that, but it's a real important thing to have the thread tape around the right way and then you can twist it out pretty easy. Usually you'll do six or eight, 10. You get a feel for this. Um, and then when you thread tape, cause I've gone clockwise, when you thread tape this, uh, sorry, thread that into a valve, the thread tape doesn't spool off. Whereas if you had it the wrong way, you're gonna screw it in and it's gonna start spooling off. So you thread tape all mains water connections that aren't O-ring when you're doing this kind of work. So you'll thread tape the nipple between the ball valve and the dual check, you'll thread tape the blue line fitting into the ball valve, but you won't thread tape that because there's an O-ring on the end of it if you can't see that. So there all, we've, imagine we've built all that. We've got the valves with pressure reducers in there so the water's being delivered to the 
the drip tube and poly pipe at the right pressure. The water's being filtered. They're all thread taped up. We've got a valve box here that they'll go in so that the valves are installed underground. We haven't done it here, but we recommend that you put either a concrete slab or some gravel in the bottom of that box to keep it clean. Obviously, over time, roots are going to grow in there and snails and slugs and spiders and whatever else. If you've got a nice base there, it'll help get, I guess, drain away any water that's in there and it makes it nicer when you're working on it. Um, a lot of this stuff, I guess a lot of these systems you guys probably aren't going back to if you're not irrigation installers as such. If you're landscaping, it's probably going to be done by whoever they call. I just think it's a nice finish. And you, you've usually got aggregates on site anyway. Uh, so they're all in the ground. We'd then put the pipe onto the fitting and cut the valve box. So these valve boxes can be cut with a Stanley, well not a Stanley knife. Hacksaws. A hacksaw, a uh, recip. You could drill holes with a hole saw and slide the fitting through and put the pipe on if you want to be really pedantic. Uh, the idea behind it is that you've got an enclosed environment that's still got an air, I guess, an air gap so that you've got access to your, your, your products that are in there. Um, this is a residential valve box, so there's no bolts in it, but there is the ability for you to screw a tech screw into that to stop it from being removed by children or I guess if it was in the front yard of a, of a high-risk vandalism, vandalism area. Uh, commercially, we stock, I know there's a bunch of boxes behind Reedy over there. They come with bolts, so you can actually oh, yeah. bolt the lid down. It's unlikely that, I guess, any of the residential landscapers here are going to ever even use them, but um, I guess it's just handy for you to know that the valve boxes go up to, like, that big. Basically a bathtub. Yeah, you could bath a dog in a yeah. small human. So that's uh, a commercial valve box. The, they've got these knockouts, which then you can slide back down. In a residential valve box, you're gonna to have to kind of simulate that yourself. So you'll need to cut the, the plastic out and then put your fitting through it and either put some plastic around it and tape it up before you backfill it or put the plastic that you've cut out back around it or... And a lot of time, I mean, you guys be working with Forticon sheeting and all sorts of stuff that you can, um, like, you know, damp proofing and whatever else you can just put back against it and it just stops that soil from filling back up again. It all looks, all looks clean when you hand it over. I meant to do that. Yeah, I'll just stock tank. <laughs> you don't have to count that one now. Um, so, as you can see, Matt's pegged the drip tube down here. We've got a sprinkler in the corner, which we can connect water up to. The I've got I've put this black poly there. I'm gonna I might actually get anyone that's interested once I finish talking that wants to come over here and have a shot at like punching a jab into there and putting a dripper into there and putting a cobra clamp on and that kind of thing. Um, I'm conscious that there's obviously a lot of people here that have done this before. Um, even though it is basics, but um, yeah, it's probably, I always find it's easier. It's, it's, it's better to learn by doing than have someone to stand there talking to you for 40 minutes about it and then just get in your car and go. Uh, the wire would then be connected. So this, imagine that's in there. Uh, and the water's coming in. We will then take the cables off of the solenoid valves, strip them back, get them clean. I might get you to wire these up actually. So the valves that I've got here are a, an AC valve, so the, the actual polarity of the wire is, is not a problem. When you're using a battery operated solenoid valve, the wiring polarity is relevant, so they're direct current. So if you can see here, the wire that goes to the coil have has red and black cables, and then they go into the, the controller. So if you were to cut that off and didn't wire them back up red and black, or buy, you can buy these as a six station version and they'll have a red and then, sorry, a black and then four, six reds. If you don't get that wiring right, the, um, the battery won't be able to actuate it. So it's just the way the electricity works. Because the mains power that we have delivers and an alternating current, these don't, it doesn't matter because it's electricity going back and forth. What happens is the power will lift up the, a pin inside here that changes the pressure in the valve and that actuates the valve after the electricity has been sent down these lines. Um, you can get them around the wrong way. You just have to make sure that the valve has electricity going to the two cables for it to actually turn on to so the common and then one or the common and then two. So Matt's wiring them up using gel connectors. So they're just a, a, a I guess a pressed down metal filled gel filled connector. Um, I don't know if you guys can see it from there. There's some metal teeth in that and then there's a silicon in that. The big one we're going to use for the common because we're going to be joining 
in this case, three wires together, but in a six valve box, we're gonna be putting seven wires into this one thing. That's the black and then all the commons. So I don't know how Matt goes. I'll usually choose like the, all the ones on the same side of the coil and then wire them together. And then I'll wire um, in alphabetical order of color to number. So obviously there's six or eight colors in there. I'll go like blue, brown, and then so on, so that I know that the B was valve one and then the other B was valve two. And then so, it, it look, it's, you don't need to go to that extreme, but all these little tricks that you can learn along the way are gonna make it easier when you're installing. And even if you've got a team of people that are doing the same thing, using black for common, it's important because then when you're troubleshooting, you're going back to black and you're thinking about it. And then if they're like valve two, they're like, that must be blue. So they learn blue, you know, tricks around unrolling tube and using thread tape and I guess some standardization for your business around the products that you're using so that the spare parts are, are on board all the time. Anything else? No, that's right. So that cable uh, generally will be direct buried in the ground. We recommend that when you strip the wire, you don't, don't do what some controls are like replicas. Strip it back four inches? Inch. Yeah. Inch. Look, he's, uh, he's probably only stripping it because I'm here. Usually he wouldn't. Yeah. 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 These gel connectors are designed to not require stripping. They'll the so you've got your wires and they'll go like that and they'll they'll grab it. So um, yeah, have you cut them back? No. So you probably find. I, I guess I for, for when I was installing myself, I never used the small wire joiners um, purely on the fact of getting you can't get the, the sheath in there. the sheath in and what have you. I used to just basically stick with the blue top the whole time. Had one product and then I could just all I'd. I'd did was basically these little show bare copper. I just cut that off, yep. put them in, and then that way you alleviate that problem. You, you basically your cable is protected all the way into that connection. Because the biggest problem I used to have from a a fault finding point of view on irrigation, where the, they said it's not turning on, was a valve box would get wet over winter, and that cables then got corroded. And so the wire joins still fine, but that cables corroded, and then. It basically acts like a pump, so water actually just gets continually with heat during the day and night. Water can end up going you know, 30, 40 metres up this cable and destroying the whole cable path. So, um, yeah, and then start again, basically. So, exactly. Uh, you shouldn't have to strip them with the smaller ones, but these these are originally designed around, I guess, the Telstra cable, which is even smaller again, so it's a bit easy to get in. Um, whereas with this larger one you sort of you're never going to have an issue and it also allows you to then get up to that one mil size so if you did have more than one cable going in on your common you sort of just got a one product fits all it's twice it's the really price of price. this but it's if you were happy just to spend the two dollars 16 or whatever per joiner rather than the 50 or 80 cents per little joiner and never have to worry about it and know that it's always going to work and know that your guys are only dealing with one joiner just do that um The solid, some sort of, yeah, so the Hunter cables are quite thick. I think Rainbird's probably not as bad. Still quite thick, yeah. Yeah, as in the sheath. Yeah, that's right. Um, the, what valve do you use, Hunter? The red, they're red? Or what? Yeah, so they're quite thick. They're a similar sheath. Um, I think that's probably why people were sheathing them. And what to your point, you never quite, you, you might have it in there, but the gel's not touching the, the, the plastic. So if you can... Yeah, he's got this big tennis ball of silicon. And by the time you've done that, the Dura connection was the way to go in the first <laughs> yeah, place. So. Yeah, silicon. So you can not obviously solder these if you really want to go crazy. I've not seen it. Oh, there's DBR joiners. Can you grab me a DBR wire? Um, you guys would have used these, obviously, in most of your jobs. They're a massive 600-volt uh, uh, joiner that's got um, a base cap that's got, a, I guess, a spiral of teeth in it. And you, you do do sheath them because you get the the inch of or ten, twenty mil of copper exposed, and you twist it together, and it pulls it into a ball at the end, and then you shove that into the silicon joiner and cap it up. So I mentioned decoder systems before. You have to use them with decoder systems because of the the sensitivity of the joins, and you know the, honestly, the weakest point of those systems is the joins because everything else just works. So Matt's wired that up. The cable will go back to a controller. I'll open this up and show you guys because we've got a little bit of time. Um, so this is an outdoor controller. I would recommend that if you're going to buy a controller at all, I would only buy outdoor controllers. The cost difference between indoor and outdoor now is so minimal. We, Some manufacturers aren't even bringing them in and, and the other ones we just choose not to stock them because they just don't sell. 
Um, so that's the cap that I mentioned before. It's got a metal uh, base in it, and then that twists the, the copper, and then you basically pop that open, shove that into the bottom, so that's sitting in there, and then you've got the wires coming out both sides, and that's filled with gel, so there's no way that there's any water getting in that. This is my favorite controller. Um, it's quite a inexpensive for what it is. It's Wi-Fi compatible, but you don't have to buy it as a Wi-Fi controller to start with. You can pretty much take the whole controller apart. So this comes off, that comes off. So that's the brains of the controller. That's the electricity of the controller. And that's the weather proof nature of the controller. You can take this and put a battery in it and program it from the comfort of your lounge room or your kitchen or you know, if that's been put in a shed somewhere and there's, it's dark and you can't see what you're doing, you can do all the programming here. That was really important up until about November 2016 when they, or they, not, I don't think they brought it out then, but in 2017 when the Wi-Fi dongle came to play, you can plug the Wi-Fi dongle in to here and put that back in the controller and programming that controller from your lounge room or your kitchen is no longer relevant because you can program it from your phone. So that goes back in. The reason I like these controllers is because of they're, they're quite, they're backwards compatible. So when Rainbird brought out the, the, the Wi-Fi device, you could buy just a faceplate for the controller and put it into a base if you already had it there. They're expandable out to 22 stations. They come as a base four, so you're not committing financially to buying a big controller if you don't need it. And they're... Um, they, I guess they're quite feature rich. They're now Wi-Fi compatible. So what, what do we sell a four station one of them for like 160 trade or something? Yeah. Yep. You can't buy a controller anywhere near that from a quality point and, and like all the other features that you've got, like so you can expand it, you can Wi-Fi it, but you don't have to do it. So you can buy the four and just leave it there or you can buy the four and modulate it out to 22 and you've got a strong 22 station controller for less than you'd buy anything else commercially or you can add the 140 for the Wi-Fi module and you've got a Wi-Fi controller. It takes it puts the choice in your hand as a consumer rather than you buying the the really like so the HydroWise is a good example. If you want to go Wi-Fi, HydroWise is the most feature rich Wi-Fi controller, but your entry level is their top like is everything. So you're going to buy you have to buy what a contractor kit. We don't have to if you want to get weather stations. It just yeah. does more stuff. So it it's got flow sensing capacity. This doesn't have flow sensing. Um, it's why it it can reference weather stations. This can't re reference weather stations. But this is a good middle I guess top quality middle feature controller for most people so um, if you put a HydroWise Wi-Fi controller in with flow sensing and that kind of thing you're looking at getting into maybe even to a thousand dollars for the for the setup so um, whereas you could have this in as a Wi-Fi controller for you know three hundred dollars for a four station controller and then you can module it out so um, those cables are going to go into the base of this controller. This controller is mounted to the wall and plugged into the 240 volt. That transformer in there converts the power down to 24 volt, which is how they operate. You might not be able to see it, but you've got master valve, common, one, two, three, and four. Um, a master valve is something that I haven't talked about yet. Uh, we don't seem to do it a lot here in SA. Um, a master valve is basically a solenoid valve here in front of the other two valves, which is designed as a protection for the other two valves. Um, so when the controller turns on it will open the master valve first then water will rush through to the rest of the valves then it will open one and two and so on um, in pump systems it's probably used more um, when you're putting a master valve in that's the same as the valves i don't see the point but you've probably got some some good reasons of it's just a secondary protection isn't it yeah um i guess a lot of the new blocks with like you see now are like i guess they've subdivided the blocks and you got such a long way to the back of the house you've got a small yard and then you've got so far but when we come off of the water here um and you say you've got two valves like we've got here one doing the front lawn one doing the front uh garden beds and then we want to continue this all the way out the back this is where i normally would then put a master valve in which is another solenoid before all of it which just depressurizes the that whole network reason being if you've got nice pathways all the way down the side it just prolongs the life of that pipe um, that when it's the only time it's pressurized is when the system's on um, so you, yeah you've basically got an entire length of pipe going down to then the last two spring or the last two valves at the back of a house when they're not operational they're not under that static pressure that the network's providing they're just depressurized there's no water in it 
and it'll only turn on then when the system comes on. It's just a bit of a protection for the sake of... Well, you can actually probably put a high-pressure valve there if you really wanted to. So yeah. these valves are rated to 1,034 kPa. You could put a 1,600 kPa valve here, which is obviously a lot stronger, and that's kind of like your security guard for the for the rest of them. But hmm. So they're, they're ready to go. So that that's, I guess, the gist of controller through to um, the full system. Um, the controller then turns the valves on and off, water flushes through, pops up sprinklers. So I guess we've gone, just as an interest, we've used that one as the sprinkler valve. Yep, so that's the 40 and psi. This, and then this one would have been the garden valve. So, that's 30 so PSI. obviously following that wire back to that valve, I've chosen the blue. And then the red color that's off this cable, I've gone to the second valve. Um, that then corresponds back to, same thing, back at the controller. The blue valve was what we said we're going to use for the sprinklers. So we'd say, okay, we know that that sprinkler is going to be our station one. So we put that into the number one port on the controller. Um, and then the red one would go into the number two port or the number three port or whatever you needed. And then that black that we we're talking about being the common, that can go into the C or the M, uh, the P. It's definitely a, um, it's a common point on this controller and pretty well. COM on that controller, but yeah. Pretty well, all, all modern controllers now are clearly a C. And then that's basically that return line that we were talking about earlier. Um, and then you've still got available stations so then if you had these going this cable continuing out the back you'd be the same thing you'd wire up your front with it and pick a color and just just a case of marking down i guess in a book a or whatever that you've a little, done a, a little sheet in the front of your controller um that you can write down what you've done on it uh yeah so it's all here so you write down what each area references so that's lawn you know front lawn garden whatever but the new the new app the wi-fi app you can actually take a photo of the zone Correct. and name it and then it's valve one so you can be on your phone and you can just look at it and, and even as a contractor with a product like this you could have how many like hundreds you have hundreds on the app? I, think it's, I think it's about 70 odd that you can have in there. so you can have all your sites that if you had a maintenance division as well as the construction division you could have all your sites in that controller and you could go there and just walk around and then because you're not going to remember the names of their areas or whatever you're like oh yeah that's that lawn and you just turn it on because you can familiarize it with the photo and then that that pops up and um, you can walk around and do whatever troubleshooting you need to. Cool. So, I want to talk a bit about troubleshooting. Um, then I'll talk about some controller programming. Um, and then food should be here. And then people can either choose to stay here and eat food or go home and talk about irrigation with their families. So, the most common problem we have would be valves not turning on or not turning off. Would that be fair? Yes. If a valve doesn't turn on, it's either not enough water pressure, no electricity, it's on backwards, or it's got a rock in it. So if you get called out to a site and you're having issues with the solenoid valves, you want to start by, I guess, going through the checklist. Is the valve like in the right direction? So these have got a flow direction written on them, so you check that. Um, is the coil screwed all the way in? Yep. Okay, cool. So take the coil out. Does the valve start operating? So these are when you open up a coil, so that's, that's the coil at the top of it, when you unscrew that, it simulates the electronic action of the pin lifting because you're actually lifting it up. And if, it, if you do that and then it rushes and water comes through, then you've simulated the action, which means the actual electronic action isn't working. So now you've diagnosed that you've gone down, there's a cable issue. So you can start chasing the cable. So you can go back to the controller and go, oh, the cables aren't in or they were wired up wrong. It, you can't, it's very hard if there's a breakage in the cable to, 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 to kind of identify that. So that would be the last thing that you'd address. If you've got a spare solenoid valve, which I don't in a shop of irrigation, you take that valve over and wire it straight into the controller or use a multimeter and test that the actual point that, you're, that the controller is not damaged. Because these obviously these are a modular controller. So you might find that the module, see that module there, you can unlock that and slide it out. That's just a lock. So the other modules might not have been installed properly. So it could be an electronics issue. If it's closed, sorry, if it's on and it won't turn off, it's likely that there's something stuck in there and that's when you need to open up the, the bonnet of the valve, take the diaphragm out, check it for damage, check there's no rocks in there, that kind of thing. That's probably it really for valve troubleshooting. Yeah, the valve staying on is normally the most common Oh, it could be low one. flow as well, couldn't No. Because you've got, normally we'll see rocks in there because we've... It's usually this one as well. <laughs> The rocks just... It'll be the, la the last... We valve. always hear it on, on the phone. The last valve in the line is the one that's stuck on. Um, and we guarantee if we unscrew the top of that, there'll be bits of dolomite or rock in there. 
Or they'll um, bring it back and say the valve's broken. They're like, not me, man. And if you like, just tap it, there'll be a handful of rocks that will come out. Yeah. Um, but it will be because it just needs that last manifold flush. Um, no different to what we were doing with the drip tube, flushing that for it so water can get through the drippers. You want obviously clean water getting into your valves. There's there's small moving parts in there that don't like rocks. So, um, If you're having an issue with your sprinklers popping up, so that would be probably the other thing, either we're not getting enough water to the drippers or we're not getting enough water to the sprinklers. We've had instances recently more than ever where the pressure or the flow that you tested originally on site is no longer the pressure or flow that's being delivered to the site because of SA water reducing pressure because of demand on the whole system or because of um, you know more houses being built in the subdivision and there's more load required. Uh, a tip that we've been giving all of our trade clients is to actually record the pressure and the flow that you're testing when you design the job and make that part of your quote or, or your submission to the client um, so that when they call you back and say your system's not working, you can say, well, let's do the basic tests that we would usually do and you test the flow and you realize that the flow has been reduced so then it's not, you know, it's nothing you've done wrong and you've actually got evidence of that. Um, if the system was working when you put it in and it's not working now, it's either that there's a blowout somewhere or the pressure's changed, that's it. Or there's yeah. rocks in the filter. Yep. So the sprinklers can obviously get blocked up. Uh, if it didn't work from the start, you've, you've given us the wrong information or there's been an issue from installation, these sprinklers always use the water that they've been... I guess the data that we've been given. Companies like Rainbird and Hunter and Toro spend millions of dollars testing these products in a test, like a you know, wind environment, wind tunnel environments, and I guess external environments with catch cans and that kind of thing. Um, it's always funny when we have someone come back and everything's not working, and they're the only person that's ever had that product not work, and all of it's not working. We can generally go with that it's a user error, not a product fault. In saying that. Um, these are manufactured products, so there are times when there is a product fault. And in our experience, the majority, the manufacturers we deal with will always stand up and, and take it on the chin and go, okay, well, I mean, I had a situation and I, I only mention it because it happened. I don't know that they do it all the time. But Rainbird had a, a bunch of drip tube go out to site with no drippers in it. So the drippers were in the actual pipe, but they hadn't cut the... Rainbird manufactured their pipe differently to Toro. So Toro have these holes drilled near their tube. Rainbird had a, a, a boat dripper inserted into the thing and then they'd have a blade cut the, the top off to open up the hole. And they ended up coming to the party in the tune of about three and a half thousand dollars for that contractor to rip that tube out and, do, and give them new product as, as well. Even further than that, they gave us compensation for the loss of the potential sales. It was, yeah. So the, the manufacturers are pretty good. Obviously, you're not gonna find that um, same support potentially um, if you don't buy professional products from a professional irrigation shop. Uh, what else would there be? Drip tube, drippers not dripping. Drippers, will, drippers won't work if the pressure's too high or too low. So if you've found that you've turned your system on and there's no water coming out, there's a good chance that there's too much water coming into the system or too much pressure coming into the system. Um, or the drip tube's faulty, but it's not likely. No. Um, kids. Turn your mains off. Yeah. Yep. Oh, your water meter. <laughs> yeah. Have done all this and that. I'm like, oh, okay, we'll do a manual bleed on your valve and everything else. Yep. Stop. Go and turn your tap on, on the side of the house. There's no water coming out of it. I said, well, go to the meter now. Just <laughs> down the street and see if any blinds suddenly close like that. Yeah. It's like, oh, the meter's been turned off. Did you do it? I'm like, oh, no, no. We don't need to turn off the water anymore. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I guess that's what Clint was saying is there's always some level of environmental change when we see. Sprinklers aren't popping up like they used to. It's um, we see the the big one lately has been um, all these new renovations to houses um, where new mixer taps and that sort of stuff have gone in. Plumbers will come in and put pressure regulation on, on the, the house, house yeah. on the entire house straight off the meter to protect the mixer taps from blowing apart because obviously there's a lot of Chinese import. What is it? Five hundred kPa. On yeah, all of your houses now. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's to protect the washing machine, the dishwasher. But a lot of the static reducers are not being adjusted out to 500. They're being set up at 340, 370. And we wanted our system to be running at, at that pressure, not at the water supply, but at the end of the sprinkler. So I guess in the negotiation, oh, I guess investigation, we then they say, oh, no, actually, six months ago, I did have a plumber out. And they go around the side of the house and there's a nice new shiny um, brass piece that's been installed 
which has been restricting it. So we just open that up and away we go. So um, yeah, it's you got, I mean, just to give you an idea, that that's a five year trade warranty on that solenoid valve um, from Rainbird. And that's something that's going in the ground and um, gets abused, so well, to speak. That, so when the coil's in operation, and the electricity is holding the pin up continuously. So that's buzzing and flicking the whole time. There's moving parts in that operating for yeah. five years. There's no, I mean, the irrigation solenoid valve design hasn't changed for what, 30 years? Yeah. The Rick, you mentioned you use Rickdell. They haven't changed at all, like ever. It's the same. I mean, actually, the coil, they, they made, there used to be an issue where the inside of the coil would pop out. So they encapsulated the, the pin. Nothing's changed. And there's people that are bringing them in. They're 25 years old. Yeah. So I've got Rickdale valves at home and they're 36 years and they're, they're still run <laughs> new sprinklers Solid in the front, new. but I haven't put, they're still working. So I haven't worried about changing them out. So. So um, I guess they're the, major- they're the majority of the troubleshooting um, things that will probably come up. Have you guys got any troubleshooting questions that have arisen that you want to ask now that might benefit everyone else? Aside from that one. <laughs> um, so then um, I'll just talk finally about controller programming and then um, I'll let, let open it up, uh, I guess, for any other questions. And then obviously any of you, if you want to ask us questions individually, you can just come up and have a look at this and have some have a play and anyone that needs to go, you can get into traffic before it gets too crazy. Uh, when you use an automatic irrigation controller, you can have quite basic programming right out to extreme programming where you are using, I guess, weather-based time adjustments and rain sensors and flow sensors and moisture monitors in the soil. Uh, one of the most common issues that will occur, especially in a four station controller with four start times, is my controller's coming on too much. Um, what people will do is they'll program all four stations, but they'll think they're pro- programming all four stations, but they've programmed all four start times, and they'll go back and go, oh, actually, maybe I haven't done it right, and they'll program all four stations, and then all four stations are coming on on all four start times, and all of a sudden you've got 16 start times. So I guess um, be careful. That's a good one for beginners. Be careful. Uh, these operate like any, I mean, some of you would probably remember VCRs. Um, if you, once you've used it once, you kind of get, get a knack for it. If you follow the process, and these are all designed uh, like Hunter, Rainbow, Toro, that if you start at the top and work your way around, you set the time and the date. Click, 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 click. You don't have to press enter on this one, don't you? Yep. Just whatever you've left it at, you turn it and it keeps going. That you set the time and time and date, set the watering start time, so the time that you want the irrigation to come on, you set the run times, how long you want them to run for, and then you get into your kind of, um, you're selecting watering days. So you might want to water just on Wednesdays and Thursdays, you might want to water alternate odds and evens, you might want to water every second day, you might want to water every fourth day. There's an unlimited potential with all the modern controllers. Uh, seasonal adjust is probably one of the features that you won't use much, but you can adjust your wintering, winter watering or your summer watering times. So if you've got 100% is normal, you can go out to 200% on this controller and down to 0%. That's right, isn't it? 200 and 0. Yep. So obviously 200% is doubling what you were doing and 0% is nothing. Uh, with, I guess, the advancement of Wi-Fi, I don't know how often that'll get used at the controller, being that people can just turn the irrigation on and off whenever they feel they need to based on rain events. Uh, there's a watering delay, so you might have had a really large um, irrigation cycle, uh, sorry, rain event, and then you can just say, I don't want water to, ru- to be watered for five days, and you just delay it for five days and then go back to auto, and the controller will stop everything that it's doing and it'll just resume what it was meant to do in five days. Uh, rain sensors can be installed on gutters, and all they do is they get wired into a sensor port and they break the common. So if it rains, the sensor has discs in it that expands. They are designed to evap- well, They are designed to dry out at the same rate as soil evaporation, and that I guess turns the sensor off, and then obviously turns your controller back on. Uh, there's there's a lot of testing and uh, manual programs that you can do with this this controller. And to be fair, if you're buying a Hunter, Toro, Rainbird, even if you go into you know I guess competitive brands, Skydrop, Weathermatic, Orbit, Holman. Yeah. they all do what they need to do. They all turn sprinklers on and off. They all pretty much have the same, um, I guess, c- uh, capacity for adjustments. The biggest one, you, the biggest difference you'll find with any of this is what happens when shit goes wrong. So you'll find over the years that you'll find brands that you're most comfortable with. We're very comfortable with Rainbird. We're mostly as comfortable with Hunter um, and Toro. To, like They've always just said, yes, 
look, if the even and to be fair, even if the contract is at fault, a lot of these manufacturers will come to the party and say, look, here's a new controller because the brand is more important to them than the bad mouthing that they might get. Um, from the contractor or the person that's installed it and they just ask us to ensure that we've then had that conversation and said look you did do this they've, they've come to the party but just remember that this has a feature that does that or does that um, these have advanced features such as contractor memory which we can show any of you it's obviously I need to plug it in where you can program a controller hunter the hunter have that as well yep. so you can set a program in the controller and press a combination of keys and that'll memorize that program so if your client goes out and starts pressing buttons and everything goes haywire and they rang you up and they're like this has happened, this has happened, this has happened. You can either tell them over the phone the combination of keys to press to get it back to normal or go out there and fix it for them. So um, I think that is it. The pizzas are here. That is very good timing. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yep. So, so if you've got an area like that, and there's a sprinkler in each corner. Yeah. You want to know, do you have a C shape or do you close it? Yeah, and also do you recommend branching off to each one with a T or avoiding that with a T? Honestly, at that level, it doesn't matter. Like this kind of a system would be using 12 litres a minute and you've got 20. Um, I, you can get in on this as well. Matt's done a lot more design than I have. You wouldn't even know. You couldn't You couldn't test the differential. You'd, you could put catch cans out and you wouldn't... You, it wouldn't matter. Um, I used to like, I guess, when you had that kind of situation to come down and sweep around and then tee in so that your sprinkler's like that. That's what you're saying? Yeah. Because it enables you to get your sprinkler right in, especially if you've got, uh, I guess, concrete footings that have been poured for wet lay and you, you know, you're having to chip away the whole edge to get in there. That's a great way of doing it. If anyone doesn't understand what Chris is asking, I don't have one here. So, you know, that sprinkler there uh, could go on a, a three, well, they call it a three corner jack or a side outlet elbow. So that would be what would have gone in if we did it that way. Instead, he's saying, can we just have a fitting like that that sits in the corner and then you tee past? It's completely up to you. And so with the closed curve, it would just be seen on the other straight line. Yep. I would. Like, when, when you're looking. Yeah, when you're looking at four sprinklers, um, it's not an issue uh, in a residential side of things. If you're starting to want to do, yeah, exactly right. So when you're starting to want to have slopes um, or you've got, a, I guess, an area that's not four or five yeah, metres, so you're, like you're wanting to have a gear drive sprinkler that's actually doing like that. 10 metres or so, I've always recommended and that they loop, they loop that circuit. Um, Reason being is you're ensuring that the pressure that you got at the start, the sprinkler closest to the valve, is going to be the same pressure that you're going to get at the further sprinkler. Whereas if you don't and you have it on a straight run, there's going to there's potentially a pressure differ difference there, which means you're going to get five meters of throw at the closest sprinkler and maybe four and a half meters of throw at the furthest, which still may be okay as far as a, I guess a full coverage, but your application rate is now different. So you you got a higher application rate closest to the valve and further away whereas all that you might have had to have done is just loop it up for five meters of pipe and now you've got even coverage around the whole thing so we've even had you, you don't have as much you shouldn't have as many issues because you'll still be getting the pressure yeah because your system's not so hungry no matter how like most residential systems now, no matter how many sprinklers we need to put in there, there's still more water than they need for one valve. So it's when you start talking about gear drives and you're running 10 litres a minute per sprinkler instead of 1.5 and you've got three on and you've got 30 litres a minute from a 38 litre a minute source and they all need what, 250 or 300 kPa, that's when it starts to make a difference. Um, commercially, we've designed systems recently where the main line's been looped to ensure, like, because it's a, you know, a whole park, and obviously that. Keeps the other, the other benefit too of that is if we're, if you're in a situation where, you've got twenty liters a minute available on your flow test that you've done for a house, and we can get, all your station, all your sprinklers will run on eighteen liters a minute, um, which is I guess almost right at the upper limits of what your house can provide. I'll always try and loop that 
it's just a bit of contingency to just say it's going to make sure that it works. Plus, if we need to cut it in half, like if that doesn't work, and you just want it, you can cut it in half a lot easier. Yep. And you're not, you know, especially if the water's over that side. Yeah. Um, the the men, you mentioned slope, which made me think of um, uh, check uh, Sam's or check seals. Yep. So. Um, sometimes if you've got a sloped area and there's a sprinkler there, there and there, coming down like that, when you turn the system off, that sprinkler will drain, the whole, all that pipe will drain into that sprinkler. You've, there's products available that are a rubber seal that sits into the bottom of a sprinkler that you can retrofit to any of the sprinklers or you can buy them already with them. All you do is remove the body of, or the, the inside and it clicks into the base of that. So um, obviously when it pops up, the sprinkler just operates. When it drops down, that rubber seal closes off and then it holds the charge in that pipe so you're not getting flooding issues. Um, it usually happens in really nice wineries and just floods the bottom. So yeah, does that answer your question, the, the, the loop? Like just loop it if you're concerned. But if, you, like, if you've got a concern, if you can't trench that and it's MPs, I wouldn't. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I guess I've always, we've got, I've got landscape customers that I've just said standardise everything wherever possible, loop it for the cost of 19 mil poly and another T, loop it um, and it's good practice um, and at least that way if you ever wanted to add, you know that you don't have to think about where your pipe stopped and started, you know at least you've done a ring and you can just dig down and cut in at some point. Especially if technology has changed, you know, some of the pipe that's in the ground has been there for 20 years and MP rotators didn't exist back then. It enables the homeowner to, I mean, not that you're probably, it's not going to be your concern, but they could then stick sprinklers in there and they know that the pipe's going to be there. So, yep. Um, any other questions? Cool. All right, cool. Thank you so much for coming. Um, there's a bunch of pizza over there. I do appreciate your attendance. Um, obviously, we're here um, all the time to answer these questions. Um, it's really important to me that we offer a level of service that's above just selling you sprinklers and you leaving. So, don't hesitate to ask any questions, even if you feel like it's a silly question. Um, do you got anything to add to that? Um, no, I guess just recapping on the controller programming just quickly was Clint was saying about start times and run times. Just always remember that your start time is just when you want the irrigation to come on. And that only needs to happen normally once. And it's, you say you want it to come on at eight o'clock at night. That's not, when it says start time one, that's not for start, for irrigation one, uh, sorry, for station one. It's for the first time that that irrigation program will start. And then your station run times are your individual stations. So that'll stop that, that doubling up of, I guess, overwatering. So I've got a bunch of shirts and hoodies over here. Um, I don't have enough of both to give everyone one of each. Um, I also don't have enough sizes to guarantee that everyone fits them, but um, I can give everyone one of each. And if you've got a burning desire to have two of each, then we can negotiate that as well. Um, help yourself to some food over there. There's beers in there. I think we've got some non-alcoholic stuff here as well. Uh, thank you. Take your show bags as well. <laughs>